So, you know, there it was, the script that Josh Stolberg and Pete Goldfinger had written that, that is all John Kramer all the time. And, um, you know, not only that, but um, it, it, it sends him on kind of a unique personal odyssey to Mexico uh, in pursuit of hope, in pursuit of, uh, of, of salvation from the cancer that's killing him and winds up uh, making him even more angry <laughs> than he was in, in Saw 1, right? So uh, uh, it just seemed like the, the, the best and only direction to go. Yeah, I think it's actually something that was inevitable because uh, there's, it isn't just backstory, it's like all this insight into his character, right? And this is such an emotionally charged film. So it just added so much value and weight to the story. And it really affected everything, you know, uh, in that back third especially. And I feel like the audience, you know, I'm, I'm as an audience member and I see the people watching, you know, it's like they have some insight on his moral code. Uh, they see his tenderness, they see his intensity. It's like a whole spectrum of emotions. And I don't believe that we were able to see that in previous Saw films. And this is just something that makes this film very special. When you talk to the fans, you have to listen, you know? And what do the fans say? They say, we love those early Saw films. We love Tobin Bell. We love that relationship with Amanda. You know, we want those traps to be diabolical <laughs> and horrific. And, you know, I feel like that's what we gave them. We didn't want to overuse him. I mean, generally in the Saw films, he, he just features in, yeah. in one or two scenes uh, uh, before he's discarded, because um, he often does get abandoned by John at the end of these movies. But uh, in any event, um, we wanted to save him till you know after the halfway mark in the movie, but I think it's still nice to just have the light burst on. Mm -hmm. It's a very similar composition to what James made for Saw Two after Amanda survives her, her trap, and uh, you yeah. see this hor horrific thing come out of the darkness. But um, you know, we, we, we definitely played with the tone a little bit here because uh, you know, it, it's it's very scary. The first time you watch Saw One, when you see this this freaking puppet yeah. come out. In in this one, we knew there was going to be cheering when yeah. he appears, and uh, we wanted to ride a little bit of the playfulness of of just the absurdity of this puppet driving with no visible means. You know, James and I always talked about in, in Saw One, you know, there's there's this guy on the floor like <laughs> pulling him forward and then pressing a button to make the mouth say, uh, you know. You've Much respect to that guy. <laughs> but Billy now, in many ways, has become the ambassador totally. of Saw X because we see him all over Las Vegas, we see him in Mexico City, we saw him in Los Angeles, <laughs> and he is the face that, you know, so many people just absolutely adore Billy. They absolutely love him, and when he was on set, you know, all the crew would like to get their photos taken. They, he's, a, he's just loved. I think what happens is we start with the pages, you know, the outline of those traps, and then it, it really starts getting into, into like taste, you know, so Kevin and I have our taste of what we want, what we feel is horrific, uh, that a lot of changes happen when we start doing the tests, mm -hmm. because certain things are going to work, some things might not work, uh, we want to emphasize uh, the brutality. Uh, you know, we put together uh, storyboards. The storyboards really, you know, tell us what we're doing. Sometimes it's not all of the crew. There's just part of the crew uh, running the wheels of the gears, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, we just want it to be a true reflection of John Kramer. And that's where it becomes real, and that's where everybody's invested in the film. There certainly, are, there certainly aren't that many that, that go on this long, but yes. And the audience needs to be invested in the characters, and they need to feel to a certain degree that specific components of that movie are real, like that they believe in it. Once they believe in it, then there's like a lore, right? And then they can continue with those characters to the next one. And as you see our, crazy, our beloved fan base, oh, yeah. right? They tell you this, this, and that, or what's gonna happen here and here. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, they take photos of all our traps, every piece, they start making notes. <laughs> There's people in Japan, Germany, wherever, like 
drawing new traps and their concepts of what they would like to see in the next film. So I think when you have that investment, when you believe in it, uh, then that's where the magic happens. Yeah, because some franchises, they um, uh, pretty quickly start doing things that are really out there. You know, mm -hmm. I, I love Halloween 3, but you know, it, it doesn't have much to do with the other ones, uh, is an understatement. Uh, so y you kind of want to make sure that you're, you're, you're doing your core story. Um, you want you want to have people on your team that are that are very committed, you know, and are, are giving their heart and soul to it. Uh, I think probably the closest comparison might be the paranormal, paranormal activity in its heyday because it also started as a as a very simple low budget story. But um, the way they moved forward with it um, was kind of similar because uh, first it was a prequel. To, to Paranormal 1, and then it was a prequel to that, and uh, I, I, I don't even, I think 4 might have been a prequel too, but, but they, they tried to, they tried to um, sort of interleave the stories all together, so you know, they, they would be referencing each other in ways that were rewarding for the audience, right? So there's, there's something to be said for that.